Um, Charlie, take it away. In this next talk, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Noah Whiteman. Uh, Noah, please tell us about your living history. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to do this. Um, so I'm at UC Berkeley. I'm a professor in two departments, one integrative biology and the other molecular and cell biology. You can follow me on Twitter and visit my lab webpage if you're interested in contacting me or, or uh, discovering more about our research. So I'm an evolutionary biologist, and uh, the question <laughs> that motivates me is, uh, you know, who are we and, what, and how did we get here? And by we, I don't just mean humans. I mean the creatures with whom we share the biosphere. And of the named species of life on Earth, the majority are either plants or insects that eat them, or herbivorous insects. And that is what my lab studies now. And we mainly study plants that produce toxins that are also of biomedical importance. So that would include things like cardiac glycosides, uh, various terpenoids. And then we try to understand how these insects uh, deal with these. Um, how they evolve to resist the toxins and even sequester them and use them for their own devices. An example of this was research that uh, we led that uh, allowed us to understand how the monarch butterfly, which is poisonous, it has cardiac glycoside heart poisons that it holds in its bodies, in its body, um, from when it was a caterpillar. And it gains those from the milkweed plants that the caterpillars eat um, that produce the cardiac glycoside toxins. And we used uh, CRISPR to create fruit flies that carried the various mutations we identified in the target of that toxin called the sodium pump. And using these uh, living uh, flies that carried monarch mutations, our so-called monarch flies, we sort of reconstructed the adaptive walk that these butterflies uh, have taken over the last few million years. But I um, wasn't always studying monarch butterflies and CRISPR. <laughs> so um, I was born in Southern California. It's a picture of Huntington Beach. My parents had moved there from Northern Minnesota for a few years. They had me and then they moved back to Northern Minnesota to, to raise my brother and I around our, our families. And our families um, were from uh, Duluth, Minnesota, which is uh, right at the Western tip of Lake Superior, the largest uh, lake in the world in terms of surface area. There's the area lift bridge, and it looks like this for maybe half the year. There's um, ice <laughs> covering Lake Superior. It's a very cold uh, place in the center of the North American continent. And then when I was about, um, yeah, so when I was about three, they arrived in Duluth. There's a picture of me on the left and my brother. We're looking at tadpoles in a little uh, pond on the edge of Lake Superior. And he and I were fascinated by nature from a very young age, and I never grew out of that. So you can still see me doing things like this on a daily basis. This is a picture of my childhood home um, where we lived in Duluth, this neighborhood called Lakeside. Here's the school I went to. When I was about, oh, I should mention, my parents did not go to college. Uh, my mom stayed at home. And then eventually she sort of did inventory at gas stations for candy. Um, and then my dad was a salesman at many different places over the years, selling furniture, used cars, insurance, et cetera. And when I was 11, they moved about an hour north of there, um, sort of in the middle of nowhere, because my dad uh, took a job up there selling furniture. And so this was a major shock because it's so rural and isolated. Um, and I, I took it for granted then, but it turns out that it's one of the most uh, important places for boreal birds in the lower 48 states. And so great gray owls are more there during uh, eruption years than any other, any other place in the lower 48 states. We had timber wolves on our, our land, and this place was called the Saks Zim Bog. And it had been uh, one of the few arable um, farming areas in St. Louis County. But over the years, over the decades, it, it lost a lot of people as those people moved to bigger cities. And so um, the school I went to is now closed. I had 15 people in my senior class, and there were about 150 in the K through 12 school. So it's a very sheltered place but also very incredible in terms of the biodiversity. And I was gay and that made life kind of difficult for a teenager up there, I can tell you that. So it was kind of isolated. It wasn't like uh, the way things are today. This was a major challenge. I, I had a podcast where I talked about this. 
Um, and then I went to college at a small college in Minnesota called St. John's University. I call these the pre-med years because it, it took a while to understand that I could be a biologist. So I went there with the intention thinking I like science, I like nature. The advice I got was, well, you should be a doctor. So um, I took the pre-med classes and this campus is kind of amazing. So it uh, half of it is this old German um, uh, monks created these, you know, brick mo uh, monasteries and quadrangles. And then Marcel Brewer, the Bauhaus architect, was hired to build the rest of the campus. And so it's this amazing kind of modern architecture juxtaposed with these brick buildings. But I had this secret that uh, few people knew about. I had this, I would call it a math phobia that I, that I had for some reason in high school and junior high school. And it was, it was very hard to kind of get through math classes there. And as a consequence, I did not do well, you'll see in a minute, on the GRE. And that really limited my options for graduate school. But there were some great things about being on that campus in Minnesota because it, you know, it's kind of sheltered. Uh, most of us went on study abroad experiences. And I got to go to the south of France for six months and live there um, uh, with other students. Um, you know, we studied art history. There's, there's a picture of Matisse. Um, this is, we took weekend trips to the Pyrenees. Here's a beautiful monastery in the Pyrenees. We went to Rome. So I learned a lot about things that had nothing to do with science per se, but of course they influenced me. And I'll talk about that at the very end. And then I was pre-med, I uh, came back. I took a class because I didn't really have any other room in my schedule. I took a class in entomology. And this is where I came to terms with my secret love of insects. <laughs> and it was especially when I learned about the dance language of the honeybee that Carl von Frisch discovered. And this is when I thought, okay, I really need to study insects. These are, this is an amazing thing to communicate the exact location of a floral patch kilometers away from the hive and doing so using touch and dance in a dark hive. This is an incredible thing using a compensated sun compass. Um, and my friend suggested I should join the honors college, which I didn't know what that was. <laughs> so I had to join it kind of late in, in the game. And I did. And I, I completed an honors thesis, but it was kind of late. So the faculty member that helped me, Jim Poff, he studied wasps. So that's what I studied. These social wasps um, that build paper nests that you may have seen on the eaves of your houses. Um, so he had a collection of these wasps and I did an ecological study on them. And I presented it at a local meeting. I won an award and I really wanted to go to graduate school. Um, and in the middle of that, in the middle of college, my parents moved to Las Vegas um, because we had some family there. They were kind of sick of living in Minnesota. And I started getting interested in the hot springs that occur in the desert there, these oases and these insects, these water bugs that colonize these hot springs that at that time, and still are some of them endangered. So I, I became interested in these and thought maybe I could do graduate work on, on that problem. So I contacted faculty, I applied to grad schools and I didn't get in anywhere. <laughs> and the reason was I had this strange record. I, I, did I did really well academically except in math courses. And so this math phobia, um, and I didn't do well in the quantitative section of the GRE, but I did very well in the verbal and analytical part. So it was a strange record. And so no one really took a chance at, at admitting me at the time because the GRE was, was you know, used as sort of a, a gauge. But Bob Seitz called me and he said, Noah, what's going on with the GRE and your math thing? And I said, I don't really know. And he said, well, I have a project if you want to do it on, on water beetles. And so uh, he said, you could do a master's with me at University of Missouri, Columbia. That was my one option. And I took it and I did really well. I got over my math phobia. <laughs> Bob made me take uh, st advanced statistics courses. And, you know, I eventually uh, made my way to do a PhD and I wanted to study tropical biology. So I did that at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, which is, you know, kind of a, an R2 school but at the time had the best tropical biology program in the country. And so my colleagues were probably 40 PhD students from all over the tropics, largely from Latin America. And I got to work in the Galapagos Islands. But before that, and this is, I just wanted to bring this up, I was gonna continue studying wasps, but my interest started changing and I left the lab of you know the, the, the initial advisor I had. And I was also came out of the closet then. Um, this was during the George W. Bush years when gay people were used sort of as a manipulative kind of thing in the United States to get people elected. It was not an easy time uh, to come out. 
Um, but my interest started changing. I, I was studying coevolution between plants. Uh, I was interested in studying coevolution between plants and animals. Um, and Patty Parker, another professor there, took me under her wing. She studied birds. And um, I was an entomologist. I thought, how am I going to study birds? Well, birds have lice on them. They have parasites on them. So she had a program in the Galapagos that had started. And so I got to go to the Galapagos over the course of four years. I uh, worked with Galapagos hawks. I got to catch 200 of these um, endangered birds, banned them. And we studied their coevolutionary genetics between them and the parasites. There's a picture of me sorting through a tray of lice in the Galapagos. And that was a really exciting project. And then uh, for personal reasons, I wanted to be in the Boston area. And so, um, you know, I contacted Naomi Pierce, who's a professor at Harvard, and Fred Ozabel, her collaborator at Harvard Medical School and Mass General Hospital. And I started working on, instead of birds as hosts, plants as hosts. And uh, they also are attacked by diverse natural enemies, including um, insects and bacteria. And so I was very excited um, to go there. They didn't really have funding, but I started applying for NIH fellowships, F32 fellowships, but I did and it did not get funded. And so it was sort of a difficult situation. So I was became head teaching fellow of animal behavior for a semester to make ends meet. I applied again, and then I got the fellowship on the second time. <laughs> and so that sort of saved the day. And then while I was there, I started studying um, I found this fly that attacked Arabidopsis, but it was a Drosophila, a fruit fly that actually attacked the genetic model plant Arabidopsis thaliana. And the reason that we started studying this is we wanted to develop a genetic model herbivore of Arabidopsis, which hadn't been uh, available yet. So um, with that, I got some job interviews and eventually I got an offer, offers from several places. I ended up at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Uh, I was there for six years, ran my lab, and then I moved um, to UC Berkeley. I also, at that time, about after about five years, I interviewed at Berkeley, Stanford, and University of British Columbia, and then um, I, I went to Berkeley. And so I've been here for about seven and a half years. This is a picture of my lab um, a few years ago, um, and a few things started happening, even though things were going well my car got crushed by a giant eucalyptus tree that would have killed me had I been in it. I call this revenge of the plants because, you know, I study plants <laughs> and the herbivores that eat them. And then my dad died in 2017 of alcohol use disorder. And these things uh, started descending sort of, you know, in my life and it started intersecting with my own research. And so because, not because of the car, but really because of my dad's long struggle with alcohol use disorder, um, and my own research on toxins that organisms make, ethanol is a toxin, right, that yeast make, presumably uh, for both their caloric needs, but also as a, a way to inhibit the growth of other competitor microbes. I wrote a book, and it's coming out in October called Most Delicious Poison, and it's a general audience book about the story of nature's toxins from spices to vices. And so it sort of starts with my own narrative and sort of ends with and trying to understand the last 500 years of human history through the lens of our pursuit of these chemicals that have mostly evolved through plants trying to defend themselves against natural enemies. And so you can pre-order it if you'd like. <laughs> I have a little QR code there. Um, and then I guess I will end just by thanking you all. And my piece of advice is, as you can see from my own history, um, it's very idiosyncratic and serendipitous. And my advice to you is take, the, just keep taking the opportunities as they come. There's no grand, there's no grand plan in my plan. <laughs> I can tell you that, but it looks like there could have been in hindsight, but there wasn't. I just took the opportunities as they came. So that's my advice is to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Thank you very much, Noah. Uh, and I'm uh, applauding on behalf of the audience. Um, so um, I'll ask uh, uh, one question about your talk. So you know, um, when you were faced with um, you know, lack of options for grad school, did you ever reconsider and think whether this was the right path? And so it's not like what led you to persevere and keep moving forward? Yes, I did. I really did at several points. You know, So early on, I thought, wow, maybe I'm just not cut out for this, you know, I, I thought I wrote a good, you know, research statement, 
and I'd won an award, you know, and I thought, wow, you know, it's, it, it's the, this GRE thing is really going to hold me back. And I thought that was very demoralizing. Um, but, you know, all it took was Bob taking a chance on me. So usually this is what people find is, you know, when, when students come from disadvantaged backgrounds, it takes one person, one person to inspire them, one person to help them to the next step. And that is exactly what happened. And Bob had a need, he had a grant, he had to, you know, he had a research assistant that someone had to do that work. So, you know, it's, it was just an alignment and he took a chance on me, but it was a low risk too. It was a two-year master's project. So it wasn't a full PhD, you know? So I, I took that next step and then it sort of, I, it proved to myself that I, that I could do it. Um, but, it, you know, there were many points in time where I thought that this crowd is not me. You know, I, 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 the whole thing was sort of needed to be kind of demystified at every step because I didn't have any understanding of academia or research or frankly, you know, any kind of intellectual pursuit. No one in my family is a scientist except for me. Um, and so I'm the only one with a, with, a, with a PhD in my entire extended family on both sides. So many times I felt like, hmm, maybe I'm not cut out for this. But then I thought, wait a minute, I know you know, I know enough about myself to know that I have something to contribute. And so I just kept taking the next opportunity and kept trying to be true to my own heart and my own research interests. But, you know, up against sort of the, the practical aspects where you have to also get funding. You also have to be appreciated by your colleagues for your contributions. So this is a community. It's not just all about you. Um, and so those two things, I think, you know, have always kind of been at play. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have one other question uh, from the audience. Um, so could you please share how you would reimagine academic culture with the, the benefit of knowing, like, what were the valuable moments in your own academic trajectory? Well, like I said, I, I think um, if we had more than just one person believing in someone, that would be good, right? If people felt like it was a, a group of people who were senior to them, who believed it, who really believed and supported them, I think that's something that's, that is changing for, for the positive, right? Um, I would say that in the, with the benefit of hindsight, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that the GRE is not, um, you know, doesn't hold the weight that it did because it doesn't predict success in graduate school. We know that we're scientists. We can look at the data. It's you know it's incontrovertible. Yet it's still used as a, as a way of saying, well, if they don't really have what it takes, you know, we actually don't know that. <laughs> so you know there are other factors at play. And so you know with, with the benefit of hindsight, I think my path would have been I would have had more options um, at that point. So yeah, great, great. Uh, thank you again for a very inspiring talk. Um, and My I pleasure. Back to, back to